Thank you for participating in today's webinar on the new Enhancing the Diversity of the NIH-Funded Workforce Program. We just completed the first part of our agenda where Dr. Elizabeth Wilder provided an introduction and background on this Common Fund Program, and Dr. Joyce Hunter provided details about the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities role in this program. At this time, Dr. Toya Randolph, Program Official for the BUILD Initiative, will present information about BUILD. Thank you for joining today's webinar. Again, my name is Toya Randolph and I am the program official for the NIH Building Infrastructure Leading to Diversity Initiative, also known as BUILD. Before I begin, please be mindful of the webinar tips presented here. We are not using the chat function today. You may want to hide the toolbar that appears in the upper right hand corner by clicking the first icon. On my end, this icon is the color orange, but it may look orange or red to you. Questions will be de-identified and answered during the webinar, time permitting. The slides and re recording of today's webinar will be available on the Common Fund's website at http backslash backslash commonfund.nih.gov backslash diversity within the next several weeks. This is a recap of the Common Fund Diversity Program's overarching strategy. Again, BUILD is one of three interrelated initiatives that are being implemented to enhance the, enhance the diversity of the NIH-funded workforce. I will present an overview of the BUILD initiative, and NRMN and CEC will be presented later today by Dr. Pamela Thornton. This is the outline of topics that will be presented today. In general, I will cover the topics in the order that they are presented in the funding announcement. We will review the purpose, award information, eligibility information, application instructions, and a timeline. Dr. Carol Schwartz from the NIH Center for Scientific Review will present part six, the application review information. I will return to present some frequently asked questions and open the floor so that our team here at NIH can respond to questions submitted via email during this webinar that were not answered in the FAQs. The BUILD initiative's primary purpose is to provide opportunities and resources for eligible institutions to implement transformative, broad-based approaches to the training of students in biomedical and behavioral research. In short, the intention of BUILD is to develop talent within the student body. BUILD awards are intended to transform undergraduate research training and mentoring, support the design and implementation of innovative programs, strategies, and approaches, and support institutional and faculty development to enhance the training environment. Awards will be multi-component and complex. The BUILD application is a U54 specialized center cooperative agreement. A cooperative agreement is a support mechanism used when there will be substantial federal, scientific, or programmatic involvement. Substantial involvement means that after the award, NIH staff will assist, guide, coordinate, and or participate in project activities. Successful applications will be disaggregated into three linked awards to the primary institution. The UL1 Linked Specialized Center Cooperative Agreement, the RL5 Linked Education Project, and the TL4 Linked Undergraduate Institutional Training. The NIH Common Fund intends to commit $30 million in fiscal year 14 contingent on the availability of funds. There will be approximately 10 awards and those are contingent on the number of meritorious applications received. The project period may not exceed five years. Up to $30 million in total cost may be re requested in year one. Excuse me, correction, up to $3 million in total cost may be requested in year one. Increases are allowed in years two to four to support additional BUILD students. The total cost may not exceed $5.3 million in any one year. The same increases are allowed in year five. Please note that the notice will be, there will be a notice published in the NIH guide to clarify the allowable increases. Applicants are strongly encouraged to work with their institution's grants management office to develop budgets because the indirect costs allowed vary by cores. 
there is not one indirect cost rate that can be applied for the entire budget. Certain cores will allow the full indirect cost and others, like training, will be limited to 8% indirect cost. Now we'll review some of the eligibility information. Primary institutions, those are the applicant institutions, may be baccalaureate, baccalaureate degree granting universities and colleges that receive less than $7.5 million annually in total cost of NIH research project grants or RPG funding and have an eligible pool of undergraduate students, 10% of whom are supported by Pell Grant. Annual RPG funding is the level, average level calculated over fiscal year 2011 to 2013, excluding SBIR and SDR and the America Smith Act or ERA awards. Pell grant percentages are based on 2012 student financial aid data from the IPADS data center. It is also important to note that applicants, applications must include an official letter from the institution's authorized representative certifying that the institution meets the eligibility requirements. Failure to submit the certification letter with the application may result in the application not being responsive to this announcement and it may not be processed for peer review. few slides review the eligibility information for partner institutions and organizations. First, we'll talk about pipeline partner institutions. These are two or four year academic institutions with student populations that will enrich and expand the pool of students engaged in build awards. And uh, research partner institutions are research intensive institutions with NIH funded investigators who are committed and able to serve as effective research mentors for BUILD scholars. They're expected to provide scientifically, a scientifically rich environment, expanding available curricula and pool, a pool of potential mentors willing to provide hands-on research experiences to students. Graduate medical partner institutions. Um, are institutions that lack undergraduate programs but have a pool of doctoral level students engaged in research and receive less than $7.5 million annually in NIH RPG funding. That's the total cost of $7.5 million annual, annually. They're expected to collaborate with primary institutions to provide joint programs for undergraduate and graduate students. With regard to student trainees and participants, um, eligibility for BUILD supported activities will be open to all undergraduate students at participating institutions and all graduate students at the graduate medical partner institutions. Applicant institutions are responsible for selecting students who will receive financial support. Student trainees on TL4 linked awards must be U.S. citizens or non-citizen nationals enrolled full-time in academic degree programs in biomedical science fields at the applicant institution. Student participants on RL5 linked awards must be U.S. citizens or non-citizen nationals on permanent res excuse me, or permanent residents and must be enrolled full-time at the applicant institution or pipeline partner or graduate medical partner institutions if applicable. As I mentioned previously, these are complex multi-component applications. Each application must include the following five components. The overall component, the administrative core, the institutional development core, the student training core, and the research enrichment core. The research strategy section for each component is limited to 12 pages. Remember that different cores have different requirements and instructions. I highly recommend that potential applicants read the instructions carefully and remember that the 12 page limit does not include the specific aims page. This table highlights some of the questions that should, excuse me, some of the questions that should be considered as you prepare your application. It summarizes and it summarizes many of the requirements by the core. For example, one of the most 
important questions to answer in the overall component is, what is the overall vision for the project? And the bullets below indicate some of the data and information that you should be prepared to describe in this particular component. The, table, the content in this table is not all inclusive and applicants are strongly encouraged to read the instructions carefully. As you're developing your ideas and preparing your applications, there are two areas of focus that would not be considered responsive to this funding opportunity announcement. Focusing exclusively on a particular scientific discipline, research topic area, or restricting eligibility for participation to a particular demographic group is not responsive to this FOA. In addition, focusing on general science, technologies, engineering, and mathematics, also known as STEM education, or on the preparation of individuals exclusively for clinical teaching or other non-research careers is also not responsive to this Announcement. Applications such as these will not be peer reviewed. Peer reviewed. There are some very important dates to remember. This, this is, of course, the timeline. The first document that may be submitted is the letter of intent. These are optional and are due on March 2nd. This has been updated um, March 2nd of this year. While these letters are not required, they do give the NIH team a general sense of the number of applications that may be submitted and will help us plan for review. Um, additional dates to remember are the application receipt date. It has been changed and the uh, reference notice is notice RM-14-003. The new application receipt date is April 2nd, 2014. We expect peer review to occur in June or July of 2014. The MHD Advisory Council will meet in September of 2014 and the Common Fund will review the recommendations in September of 2014. The earliest start date uh, for these awards will be September 2014. There will be a mandatory kickoff meeting in October or November for those uh, who are selected to receive funding. This concludes my presentation. I'd like to remind you that we are accepting questions via mail at buildnrmncec at nih.gov. That's buildnrmncec at nih.gov. Dr. Carol Schwartz will now review the application review information, and I will return to present some FAQs later. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Randolph. I will address the process of review and some of the criteria for um, review that are presented in the FOA and that you should attend to in making your application. Applications are received and assigned to the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. The Center for Scientific Review staff assess the applications for completeness. NIMHD program staff assess applications for responsiveness. A scientific review officer from CSR assembles a panel of experts from the extramural scientific community to perform the peer review. There are at least three assigned reviewers per application. These reviewers assess the applications based on established review criteria. Those criteria include significance, investigators, innovation, approach, and environment. During the peer review meeting, applications undergo a selection process in which only those deemed to have the highest scientific and technical merit, generally the top half of the applications, will be discussed and assigned an overall impact score. For discussed applications, assigned reviewers summarize their prepared critiques for the group and an open discussion follows. Final scoring of overall impact is conducted by private ballot. The final overall impact score is based on the average scores range 
spectrum, which is exceptional, to 90, which is poor. Overall impact is the likelihood that that project will exert sustained transformative influence on the field. This evaluation is based on consideration of the five core review criteria mentioned before, significance, investigators, innovation, approach, and environment. There are also additional review criteria as applicable for the project proposed and they are specified in the FOA. We will come back to the additional review criteria that are special specified in the FOA. First, let us address the five core review criteria. This table gives examples of the kinds of information that should be provided for each of the five core criteria. Note that there are examples that are for standard review and examples that are specific for the build funding opportunity announcement. The five criteria are listed across the top. Significance, investigators, innovation, approach, and environment. We will look at each of these specifically. Under the, the examples presented under standard review criteria for significance are, if the aims are achieved, how will knowledge be advanced? If we go to the uh, below that, there are examples that are specific for the build uh, funding opportunity announcement. So for significance, the questions that uh, should be addressed include, is the project likely to substantially enhance the engagement of undergraduate students in biomedical research training and prepare them to pursue research careers? Similarly with investigators, there's an example of uh, information to address under standard review criteria and information to address that is specific for the build uh, funding opportunity announcement that goes for innovation approach and environment. Note that these are all examples. Applicants should consider the entire list of questions for each criterion provided in the FOA. In addition to the five core criteria discussed in the previous table, reviewers will consider these additional review criteria. Overall component, administrative core, institutional development core, student training core, and research environment core. Other considerations are protections of human subjects, vertebrate animals, and biohazards. Reviewers will factor these additional review criteria as well well as the previous review criteria into the overall impact score. This table presents again examples of the additional review criteria uh, specific for the build FOA. For example, under overall core, a question to be addressed is does the application articulate a compelling and well-grounded vision for successful research career paths and predictors of success at multiple stages. Administrative core is the organizational and govern governance structure likely to support timely execution of the project and attainment of proposed priorities and objectives. There are similar questions under institutional development core, student training core, and research environment core. Remember that the criteria above are presented only as examples, applicants should consider the entire list of questions included in the FOA for each core. At this time, Dr. Toya Randolph will return to cover frequently asked questions. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz. Um, so before we respond to questions submitted during today's webinar, I'd like to present some of the FAQs that we have received thus far. Can you apply for the BUILD multi-year award if you are not a BUILD planning grant awardee? Yes. The BUILD multi-year funding announcement is an open competition and is all eligible institutions may apply. Does the $3 million cap apply to years one and five? Is the $5.3 million 
an annual cap for years two through four. The $3 million cap in total costs applies to year one. The $5.3 million cap in total costs applies annually to years two through five. The expectation is that the awardees will ramp up spending on students in years two through four to attain maximum participation by year four, if not earlier, and continue at that level through year five. Keep in mind that it is not necessary for you to budget the entire amount. Your requested budget should make sense and support your proposed program. What are the RL5 and TL4 linked awards? The RL5 and TL4 are linked equivalents to existing NIH award mechanisms. The RL5 is the linked equivalent to the R25, the Research Initiative for Scientific Enhancement, or RISE. The TL4 is the linked equivalent to the T34, the MARC Undergraduate Student Training in Academic Research, also known as USTAR, National Research Service Award, NRSA, Institutional Research Training Grant. Can academic institutions be partners? Excuse me, can non-academic institutions be partners? Yes. In addition to academic research universities, partnerships with industry, NIH intramural research laboratories, or other research institutions may be established. If a research partner has an existing training award, will they have to transfer that program to the primary institution? No. The BUILD initiative is not intended to replicate or expand existing programs at applicant institutions. Applicants must clearly distinguish the proposed activities from existing programs at the primary and or partner institutions. Um, some additional FAQs include are there limits on the funding that faculty from research intensive, universe, intensive institutions can get to support build activities? The FOA does not state specific dollar amounts. The primary institution will be responsible for determining the amount of funds that will be subawarded to partner institutions, which should be fully justified in the application. Can faculty at partner institutions receive financial support? Yes. Funding may be requested for faculty members at partner institutions. What are the limits of build support for, to faculty at research institutions who are participating in the TL4 or RL5 activities? The funding announcement does not state specific dollar amounts. But again, always budget what makes sense for your proposed activities. We certainly aren't expecting to see applications with the vast majority of the award being sub-awarded to a research institution. What activities may build students from the various, ins various institutions participate in? Eligible students at all participating institutions, including primary, research partners, pipeline partners, and graduate medical partners, may participate in build supported activities such as seminars, mentor training, and or research experience. Eligible students at the primary, also the applicant institution, which is which the primary, which is the applicant institution, may receive build financial support through a TL4 linked training award. Eligible students at the primary institution, pipeline partners, and graduate medical partners may receive build financial support through the RL5 Link Education Project Award. Students at research partner institutions are not eligible to receive financial support through BUILD awards. How flexible is BUILD funding? Can it be used to support high school students? BUILD funding cannot be used for financial support of high school students. High school seniors who are enrolled in college bridge programs may participate in enrichment activities such as research training. Are there any limits on budget items not used for financial support of students? The FOA states specific dollar amounts only for the tra student training core and for alterations and renovations in the institutional development core. If using the multiple PI option for the application, which institution or institutions will be considered the applicant institution? 
The multiple PI option is allowed for this application. However, only one institution will be considered the applicant institution. The applicant institution should be the contact PI's institution home, institutional home or employer. Collaborators from other institutions do not count against the application limit of those institutions. Which institution is designated as the applicant institution and the number of collaborators and their roles are decided by the collaborators and the applicant institution. The NIH does not make these decisions. Will funding end in five years or will there be an opportunity for renewal? The NIH Common Fund has committed to support this diversity program for 10 years with the expectation that this time frame will be required to develop and assess new approaches to training and mentoring. All awards will have a five-year project period. Progress of the program will be assessed throughout the five-year period. Provided that innovative and potentially transformative approaches are being developed, uh, a funding announcement for continuation of the program will be released. Competition for the second phase of the program will be, be open to new application applicants as well as continuing awardees. Applicants should consider sustainability beyond the external funding. Um, now we will read some of, I will read some of the questions that we've received during the webinar and I'll respond to those questions and then I'll open the floor um, to the team here at NIH and Dr. Jennifer Webb. Jennifer Alvidrez will read additional questions. Um, one of the questions that's come as we uh, during this webinar is, can build funds be used to hire new faculty? Yes. Also remember that there should be a plan for sustaining build activities, including new faculty hires, beyond that five the five-year project period. Can there be a co-PI on build application? The answer to this question is yes and no. Um, NIH no longer uses the term co-PI, and in this role, this role is not included in the electronic submission application form. However, as I presented in the FAQs, there is the option for multiple PIs, which is essentially the same concept as a co-PI. Another option is to include collaborators as co-investigators rather than multiple PIs. Are we required to respond to the FOA and the PHS 398 application instructions? Yes, absolutely. Uh, to be responsive to this funding announcement, all applicants should carefully read and respond to the application instructions in the FOA as well as in the PHS 398. If specific elements are mentioned in the FOA application instructions, for example, the research strategy for the different cores, this means that the instructions for completing this element are different from the general instructions in the PHS 398. If no specific instructions are provided in the FOA for a particular element, applicants should follow the instructions regarding the element in the PHS 398 instructions. Please note that the budget instructions for the BUILD Student Training Corps are from the SF 424 RNR application instructions for NRSA training grants, not the PHS 398 application instructions. Just to clarify, um, in one of the questions, the previous question about can there be a co-PI on a build application, um, we are not using electronic, we are using um, paper. And so I just want to make sure that everyone's clear on that. We don't, we don't want to uh, confuse anyone. It's the paper submission form, not the electronic. Um, another question that's come in, thank you very much. Can research partner institutions partner with more than one primary part partner? Yes, the same is true for pipeline partners. However, the feasibility of the partnership and the commitment to the proposed project should be clearly stated. Partner institutions should consider how they will manage multiple partnerships if more than one applicant institution is awarded. They may also want to think about how these multiple partnerships may be viewed by the review panel. Finally, um, another question that has come in, and I think there are several others. We'll, we'll get to as many as we can, and if we aren't responding to your question, your specific question today, you will receive an email response um, later this week. Please differentiate the Student Training Corps and Research Enrichment Corps. Student Training Corps activities will be supported by an NRSA Institutional Training Award, the TL4, 
and are therefore subject to the NIH grants administration policies and requirements specific to the NRSA training awards, including eligibility requirements for student trainees and limitations on facilities and administrative costs. Under NRSA authorities, the TL4 award can provide tuition, fees, and stipends for student trainees. Research enrichment core activities will be supported by an RL5 research education project award, similar to an RL25, excuse me, similar to an R25 award. Student participants supported under the research enrichment core may receive financial compensation for participation in research activities. However, they cannot receive stipends, tuition, or fees, unlike student trainee support, trainees supported on the TL4 award. Um, additional questions and responses will be presented by Dr. Jennifer Alvidrez. Okay. Uh, is the $30 million budget for build for each year or for the entire five years? Yes. So the $30 million budget is for the entire five years. Um, the first year, again, can be uh, up to $3 million in total cost. Um, years two through five could be no more than $5.3 million annual in, to, in, in total cost. Okay. And also to clarify, I think in the funding announcement, it says $30 million will be used, the allocation will be $30 million in the first year. There will be additional allocations in years two through five for the BUILD program as a whole. Will there be another round of BUILD grants later this year or next year? No, there will not be another round of BUILD grants later this year or later next year. Um, the next opportunity to apply, we expect the next opportunity to apply for a BUILD um, um, cooperative agreement uh, will be in five years. Can there be a consortium of one or more primary institutions? No, no, no. Um, so there's, there can only be one primary institution, and that's the applicant institution. Um, one of the reasons why there is only one primary institution is because the student trainees um, from that particular institution are the ones who will benefit from the TL4 award. We cannot um, have multiple institutions cannot benefit from the TL4. Mike, do you, Dr. Sayer, do you have anything to add to that? Just that if there are other institutions that could be eligible to be primary institutions, but they don't want to submit an application as a primary institution, they could certainly partner with another institution. That, um, but there's only the, another institution which would be the primary institution. But there's only one primary institution or applicant institution for the, for the U54 application. Thank you. Can the program directors be different for the different cores, or do they all have to be the same people? Um, they, they can certainly be different. They, they should be based on expertise, um, and this is, of course, all determined um, by the primary applicant, the team um, who's coming together with the primary applicant institution. But they, they do not have to be the same person. For um, if a community college is a pipeline partner, and many of the students are part-time students rather than full-time students, are they still eligible to participate in BUILD activities? They can, yes, the, the part-time and full-time students can participate in BUILD activities um, at community colleges um, or at other institutions. They can attend things like seminars or um, other workshops, yes. Can you explain more what the statement about responsiveness means, for example, that applications that focus exclusively on a particular scientific discipline or research topic are non-responsive? The, the BUILD awards that, um, are not intended to be um, like departmental training grants, traditional departmental training grants that are discipline specific. For example, a, a, a T32 training grant for genetics um, training. The, Build awards, the, the training um, opportunities uh, should cover a broad range of research topics relevant to the biomedical and behavioral sciences um, to provide opportunities for students that have a wide range of, of interests in research, in biomedical and behavioral research. These are not intended to be discipline specific uh, training grants. The RFA only mentions letters of support in the overall component. Can we include letters of support in other 
portions of the application? Yes. Letters of support can be included in other um, cores and other parts of the application, absolutely. If an institution has a BRIC program, are they still eligible to apply for BUILD? Yes. Um, if, if institutions have any other training awards from NIH or, or other um, sponsors, you are still eligible to apply if you, are, if you meet the eligibility criteria of a primary applicant institution. Um, however, as, we, as I stated, I think in the FOA, um, FAQs, excuse me, there has to be a, a clear distinction between um, the BRIC or other training awards, um, your program implementation of those um, programs versus what you're proposing to do with BUILD. Can a medical or graduate school apply as a primary institution? No. Medical and graduate schools um, should partner with primary institutions who meet the primary applicant eligibility criteria. If, if we are collaborating with um, an organization that ultimately receives the CEC award, can we still include them in our project? Um, I can answer that. You, yeah, I was. Um, there are no restrictions to the application process, so you can uh, submit um, an application for a BUILD a mentoring or a CEC award and then also be a collaborator on another award, but the, the organization that receives the CEC award cannot be a collaborator on any of the uh, BUILD or mentoring awards, and this is something that can be adjusted post-award since the, the awards will not be known um, at the time of application, obviously. Uh, what is the mandatory executive steering committee? Are we expected to form this committee and describe it in our application? I can answer this one. The executive steering committee will be established after awards are made and will be comprised of representatives of each build, mentoring, and CEC award as well as NIH staff. So there's no need to describe the um, composition of this executive steering committee in the application. The funding opportunity announcement states that proposed external advisory committee members from outside the institution should not be named in the application. How are we supposed to describe the expertise or roles of proposed members without naming them? This is specified in the funding opportunity announcement because the naming of potential advisory board members can make it difficult for review staff to identify qualified reviewers who are not in conflict with any of the submitted applications. Rather than providing names of committee members, the anticipated roles and domains of expertise that are planned can be described in more general terms. Should BUILD applicants collaborate with mentoring applicants as they develop their applications? Or the reverse, should we avoid collaborating with mentoring applicants in our application? Coordination among the BUILD and mentoring programs will be established after awards are made. Therefore, it is not necessary for a BUILD application to include collaborations with specific mentoring applicants. At the same time, there's no restriction on collaborations between institutions involved in BUILD and mentoring applications that occur naturally in response to shared goals, expertise, or existing partnerships. So let me see if there are any additional questions. Can freshmen and sophomore students get support on the TL4, or is this only for upper division students? Freshmen and sophomore students at the applicant institution, that is the primary institution, can get support on bill. Can you clarify the responsiveness criteria about not focusing on a certain demographic group? How can we target certain underrepresented groups within that guideline? So the question um, about focusing on a specific demographic group, I think the intent of that language is to say that we're not looking for build applications that only focus on African American students, or only Hispanic students, or only female students, or only rural students. No single demographic group. The, the intent is that a diverse student 
body will be included in the build program. Can there be an international component? Um, there, there can be, inter as I think in the eligibility criteria, there can be international components, um, but they cannot be applicant institutions. They cannot serve as applicant institutions. All right. I think many of the other questions are um, have either been answered or we can provide an individual response to them after the webinar. So thank you for all your questions. Well, thank you again for participating in the BUILD webinar today. Several points of contact are listed here. If you have program-related questions, please contact me. If you had, I'm Dr. Toya Randolph. If you have questions that are related to the peer review con process, please follow up with Dr. Delia Olufakumbi sam And if you have questions related to the grants management, including budget questions, please contact Ms. Priscilla Grant. Institutions foreign involvement. Okay, one more point of clarification um, with regards to foreign involvement um, it, within the FOA, it, within the RFA, it states for the purposes of this FOA, foreign component involvement is restricted to participation of students from the applicant institution in research training activities and or research projects at foreign sites. So that's a, a clarification and that is available in the funding announcement. Thank you very much. I have one more question. Oh, excuse us, one more question. Can BUILD provide financial support for community college students? Uh, BUILD can provide financial support for community, community college students would be considered um, students at pipeline uh, partner institutions, and they could uh, receive financial support through RL5 award, an RL5 award. Any others, Jennifer? Okay. All right, uh, this concludes an overview of the BUILD um, funding opportunity announcement. The next topic will focus on the National Research Mentoring Network Initiative, and that section of the webinar will begin promptly at 1.55 p.m. Again, since the BUILD, NRMN, and CEC initiatives are interrelated, we do encourage you to participate in the full webinar, and if you can't do that today, you can review each webinar when they are archived. Um, and thank you again for your participation and interest in today's information. We will come back at 1.55. Our mics will be muted until then. Thank you. <laughs>